Thanks very much, Stephen. Oh dear, 15 years ago. Probably the same jokes. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. I'll just move this obscure uh, vision. I like to see that everybody's awake, you see, so I'll just... There we are. Um, it's great to be here. Um, nice to be with so many people that uh, apparently I've known over the years. Your, your principal, I, I knew many, many years ago. He ministered in a place called Horsforth, which is where I live, a bit north of Leeds. And I'll just check with your church historian. Which famous Christian came from Horsforth? Well, we, no, William Grimshaw was Howarth, so you're not, that's not bad. It's, uh, that's not far away. <laughs> so, clearly you can't get the staff these days. No, it's, uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to move back. Do you mind? There we are. That's better for me. Uh, uh, well, the, Samuel Marsden came from Horsforth. And, um, <laughs> And I'm sure later on we'll have a lecture um, on how Samuel Marsden, he was the first man to take the gospel to New Zealand. And he arrived on Christmas Day, 1814. So they've only had the gospel for 200 years. And come on, all you uh, clergy or budding clergy or whatever you are, if you were taking the gospel to some islands for the very, very first time and you arrive on Christmas Day, what would be your Bible text? (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm sure he got there. I'm sure he got there. <laughs> there. He preached on, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Anyway, there we are. So that's, um, it's good, really good to be here. Um, some of you may recognize the face. I am related to Jonathan from 10 of those. So if the face looks a little bit familiar, that's why. I think he's my dad or something. I've forgotten quite what it is. But anyway, so, and, and therefore it's inevitable. I'm going to bring a few books with me. I've only brought one title. I'm sorry, I came by train. And I just thought, I can't hump a load of books across uh, London. So I brought one title. Uh, Let me just mention, out there, I put a newsletter. I work as an evangelist, so I take evangelistic missions um, up and down the country. Um, This is the current one. Right on the front, there is the most amazing, remarkable answer to prayer. It is an incredible story here. But I'd love you to take it. On the back page of my newsletter, I always do an article about something that's on my mind. And for... 40 of those articles some time ago were put into this particular book called The Thinker. And it's just 40 articles on different themes. And it's the sort of thing you could leave by the loo and read a chapter, uh, you know, once a day. And um, it takes about five, seven minutes to read a chapter on all sorts of themes. And, um, well, you may have trouble. You never know. And... uh, I'll just test your art knowledge. Come on. Who, who sculptured the thinker? Rodin. Rodin. Anybody know his religious beliefs? Well, he was an atheist. He was a French atheist. Anybody know what Rodin said the thinker is thinking about? Because he told us. Amazingly. Rodin's famous sculpture was called The Gates of Hell, and it's a long sculpture in Paris. This was sculptured to go over and look at this gates of hell he says that um, the thinker is thinking about the plight of people in hell and when I came across that I thought right I'm going to write one article about that that's why it's called this look um, I, I, I texted Jonathan and said what are they likely to buy at Spurgeon's and he said they love one pound books okay <laughs> so there we are a pound and it's first come first served but if we run out if you have a word with Helen at the back I can get some to Helen in a week or two's time and she can get them to you so I give your name to Helen and we'll get them to you time we got to the word. Um, This passage, Ezekiel 47, it's an interesting one. Uh, Here's a sentence to muse over. It's not original. It comes from one of my favorite writers, Warren Wearsby. He says, mavericks make the ministry. And it is true. When you look around at some of your lecturers and other, you know, clergy, ministers, pastors, Christian leaders, They are a bit of an odd bunch, aren't they? Don't you think? There's something unusual about somebody who's going to give themselves to preaching the word, especially if it's contrary to the trend of society. Now, Ezekiel really was a maverick. 
I love his book. There are all sorts of wonderful insights that you get about the Lord, but you also get about him. He was this very, very unusual man. Like Jeremiah, Ezekiel should really have become a priest. He was born into a priestly family, but God called him to become a prophet. And you'll be well aware that he used imagery to convey God's truth to the people. He was called to be a prophet while he was a young man by the river Chebar in Babylon. God spoke to him and uh, then he, he used these visions which God gave him and uh, they were very, very dramatic. Now, the reason I, I wanted to introduce this is we come to this chapter, chapter 47, and actually the closing chapters really of the book of Ezekiel are dealing with the future of the nation of Israel. And I suppose strictly you'd have to say, okay, this is all about Israel. Earlier on in the book, you remember, Remember that Ezekiel saw the glory of God depart from Jerusalem, from the temple, from the city. That was in the early chapters. Now as we come to the close of the book of Ezekiel, we see that actually the glory of God has returned to a new temple and a new city. Chapter 43 goes through all of that. Interestingly, the glory of God came back where the glory of God had departed from. So where it left, that's where the glory of God returns. Out of the ruins came a sort of resurrection. Out of the seed came a harvest. Now, earlier on, there are detailed descriptions of the temple. And when we read them, I think, frankly, we all find it hard going. We feel we should read them because it is the word of God. But there are these detailed descriptions of the approach to the temple, the gate, the pavement, the inner court, the outer court, the post, the porch, the walls, the temples, the chambers, etc., the windows. 35 measurements altogether are given because God is not haphazard. He knows what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's designing. And then, having had this description, we find flowing from under the threshold of the temple was water. And that's where we come to this, this passage. Verse 2, the water is running out. And I understand the word here means it, it's, it's a trickle. It's just sort of dropping out like tears. It's just something very, very minimal to begin with. But verse 3 miraculously, the water that's coming out from under the threshold begins to increase. So, a quarter of a mile downstream, the water is now up to the ankles. Verse 4, a further quarter of a mile downstream, it's up to the waist. And then verse 5, a further quarter, uh, quarter of a mile downstream, it's now water that's too deep to just wade in. You, you have to swim in this water, and it couldn't be crossed. Now, wherever the course of the water went... It was, it was just dry and it was barren all round about. But when the water went there, the barrenness was transformed. There were no tributaries, there were no side streams, but nevertheless there was this abundant welling up of the water from the sanctuary that was going to transform all the environment round about. Trees were to grow. The Dead Sea, which of course salty and dead, nothing could live there. The Dead Sea's waters were going to be healed. There were fish in the flow and there were fishermen there. And the only place where there wasn't this transformation was, was in the marshes. And of course marshes only receive, they never, they, they never give. Uh, and they remained unaffected and, and, and salty. But, but leaves began to be produced on the trees and they were good for food and for medicine. Well there's this graphic vision. Now the issue is, is this just speaking about Israel? There's no doubt it is speaking about the, the nation of Israel. But is there something more? And I think there is. Because all the way through the Bible... And even through the preaching of the Lord Jesus, we get the idea that comes across repeatedly that there's a sort of, well, it's a sort of murmur that becomes a, a, a strong voice that the stream is a picture of God's heavenly blessing being poured onto individuals and onto people. Psalm 36 verse 8, and you gave them drink from the rivers of your pleasures. Psalm 46 verse 4, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Isaiah 33 21, but there the majestic Lord will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams. 
Joel chapter 3, and it will come to pass in that day, a fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord. Zechariah 14, and in that day it shall be that the living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea. And then skipping over to Revelation chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In other words, what we have here in Ezekiel 47, yes, Yes, it is applied to the nation of Israel, but it can equally be applied to the spiritual life, the spiritual experience of the Christian, of the believer. A river of enrichment that comes from God himself, from heaven, of which all may drink if we're just willing to stoop down in repentance and faith and receive what God in his grace is offering. There is a life-giving, ever-increasing stream of heavenly influence that runs from heaven to believers. It's a picture of, of salvation, but it's more than just a salvation where there's forgiveness received. It's the salvation of the experience of the Christian life, walking with and enjoying God. Well, that's the foundation. Now, what I want to do um, just briefly in this chapel service is ask us three questions. And I realize I'm talking to people who are very committed to studying the Word, studying theology, studying church history, all about Samuel Marsden, etc. But I want us to examine our hearts, and I speak to myself as well as share with you. First of all, I want us each to ask ourselves, are we... In this water. Putting it more specifically. To ask you yourself. Am I in this water? Are we absolutely certain. Each one of us. That we know we have as it were. Stooped in repentance. And faith alone in the finished work of Jesus. And we are experiences, experiencing his blessing. By receiving what he is giving us not so much what we're working for are we well have we even put our big toe in i was converted when i was 15 i was on holiday in the lebanon i was talking to roger a few moments ago about my mother who was armenian interestingly on thursday april 24 thursday it is 100 years exactly since the beginning of the armenian genocide when one and a half million people were were killed in six months my grandparents fled from the the massacre that was happening and eventually settled in the lebanon my mother was born in a refugee camp in syria so every time i see the pictures of syrian little children it always moves me i think do you know my mum was like that years ago but out there on holiday, the age of 15, an uncle of mine explained to me about the Lord Jesus dying and bearing in his body my sin. And this young 15-year-old, okay, just a teenage mind, had never really understood this before. Jesus carried my sin. He bore my sin in his own body on that cross 2,000 years ago. And I just felt... I say again, teenage logic, if he loved me enough to die for me, I must trust him. And I ask Jesus Christ to forgive me. Now, are you in the water? Has there come a moment like that? I, I realise for some brought up in Christian homes, it may be more gradual. But do you know that you're resting? Everything that you have in Christ is because you've trusted in what he has done. You're resting in his finished work. Let me read a little bit from D.L. Moody. I, I love D.L. Moody. He was an evangelist, of course, at the end of the 19th century. American guy, large of life, a very good friend of Spurgeon. He often used to preach at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. But uh, he was quite quaint in some of his expressions, but wonderfully used of God. He said, um, many men fold their arms and say, if I am one of the elect... In other words, one of those God has willed to be saved, I shall be saved. And if I am not, I shall not. No use bothering about it. I have an idea, said Moody, that the Lord Jesus saw how men were going to stumble over this doctrine of election. So after he'd been in heaven 30 or 40 years, he came down and spoke to John. 
on the Lord's day in Patmos. And he said to him, write these things to the churches. John kept on writing. His pen flew very fast. Then the Lord, when it was nearly finished, said, John, before you close the book, put in one last invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. And let him that is athirst, come. And whoever, soever, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And it's interesting that the scripture ends with this sort of huge invitation, this warm welcome to men and women, this sort of urging, with a sense of urgency, come and take. Remember the Lord Jesus on the last day of the feast, he stood up and said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his mouth will flow rivers of living water. So I want us to ask ourselves, Am I in that water? Am I really experiencing the vibrance of spiritual life that comes from what Jesus did by his death and his resurrection? Now, here's my second question. How deep in the water are you? You see, if we're truly saved, if we're born again by the Spirit of God, we won't just be content to put in our big toe or go ankle or knee or thigh deep. We, we, we want to go deeper than that. There'll be a hungering, a thirsting after righteousness. There'll be this deep down desperate desire. Like a deer pants and longs for the water brooks, our soul will be longing for him. Now I know in study, and of course you know you're here for three years and you've got exams to, to sit, etc. You can be taken up with, the, with the, the knowledge of it all. And we need this knowledge, don't misunderstand. But we can lose the vitality of it, the sort of breath, the, 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 the knowledge of God that is all consuming. How deep are we? See, dead things don't grow. And if there is real life, there will be growth. And where there's real life, of course, it pushes away uh, the, the dryness and the deadness of what has been there before. It's lovely to see green leaves on the trees. I have to say, in Yorkshire, we haven't got the leaves yet. We keep looking up and thinking, when are the leaves actually going to come? But of course, when, when the leaves, the fresh leaves come, they push off the old, the dead that didn't fall last autumn. And where the spiritual life, we find that God, by his spirit, by his word, is working within us, molding us, making us, taking us deeper into the knowledge of himself and pushing away the dead wood. It's impossible to imitate being filled with the Holy Spirit. It, it's, 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 it's just the overflow of what God is doing within us that others will notice. We may not see it, and we can't fool God, but sometimes I think, I don't know, we trifle around. You, you know that, um, that children's nursery rhyme, um, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? Well, I've been to London to see the Queen. Pussycat, Pussycat, what did you there? Well, I frightened the mouse under the chair. <laughs> it's a silly little, silly little rhyme. But you know, I think sometimes we're a little like that pussycat. We are in the presence of his majesty. And we get caught up with trifles. We just follow our own natural desires, chase the mouse under the chair, instead of thinking, I'm in the presence of almighty God. How deep in these waters are we? Is there a decreasing self-interest? How, how far downstream have we gone? How much further downstream from when we first came to trust Jesus Christ have we moved so that God has become more and more? Are we, are we wading or are we swimming and just enjoying all that the Lord has for us? What do we know of the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of God's love. There is an abundance in God which is impossible to exhaust because he's infinite. He's God. So how deep in the waters are we? And then the third question I want to ask. And that is, what are, we, what are you doing to get others into the water? What are you doing to get others into the water? If, if the waters are a picture of spiritual life, Christian experience, what are we doing to get others into the water? 
I got off the train at King's Cross today and I thought, how many people were on this train? It was just heaving. And then you come out of King's Cross and wow, all the thousands. I just sort of felt overwhelmed with the numbers of people. And everyone desperately needs to know the gospel. And again, in in college life, in theological study, it's so easy to become wrapped up with that. And yes, we do need these, these qualifications, these studies, this information, this knowledge. But let's always remember, there is a needy world out there. And we need to reach these people with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mentioning my mother again, if I may, um, her headmistress in the Lebanon, she went to a British missionary school, was a lady called Miss Fitzpatrick. And um, uh, she served as a missionary in the Lebanon for just over 50 years. She got an OBE for missionary service. And she retired to a village called Seaview, which is on the Isle of Wight, somewhere near Ryde, right on the front. And um, because of my mother and her having correspondence, etc., I was doing some beach mission work on the Isle of Wight, and my mother said, oh, you need to go and see Miss Fitzpatrick. And it was my tremendous privilege on two or three occasions to go and see her. This very elderly lady now, who lived on a house right on the front at Seaview. I remember the first time I went to see her, it was Easter time, and I said, oh, Miss Fitzpatrick, I understand you, you love to talk to people about Jesus. How is evangelism going? And she she said, and she spoke with a very posh, as far as a northerner is concerned, posh voice. Oh, Roger, she said, it's wonderful. Spoke like this. And uh, she said, it's bluebell season. And she said, I've got lots of bluebells in my garden. So she said, I go to the front gate and all the holidaymakers are going by. And I say to them, excuse me, would you like to come into my garden and see my bluebells? And she said, because they look at me and feel I'm old and doddery. They feel obliged to come in. But she said, <laughs> she said, but once I've got them in the garden, we, we talk about more important things. Because <laughs> this wonderful self. But something happened that left an abiding impression on me. It was some months later, and I'd gone to see her. I was, I was doing a beach mission, I think, in Shanklin at the time, and I'd just gone across to see her. But not now at home. She was in Ride Hospital. She'd fallen from the promenade down onto the beach, and she'd gone to Ride Hospital. In fact, eventually she was to die there. But I went to see her. She was in a single bed ward. And I sat and chatted with her. And eventually I said, look, I've got to get back to the mission now. uh, But let me just pray for you. And I held this bony hand. And I prayed for her. And then this is what happened. I said my amen. And she gripped my hand very tightly. And she just said, Roger, please will you pray for me? She said, I've been in this hospital now for three months And I haven't yet won anybody to Christ. And I don't know what's wrong. And I came away really rebuked because over the last three months, maybe in preaching, but that was different. Over the last three months, I hadn't individually led somebody to Christ, but I wasn't particularly bothered about it. Now, actually, what we're about is not only going deep in our knowledge of God and our experience with God, day by day, reading his word and praying and spending time alone in his presence, but then going out to make him known. And there are a thousand and one opportunities. I was in Staples yesterday. I bought some plastic boxes and some super glue. I went to the checkout. And um, they charged me for the, 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 the plastic boxes and I went out and I just checked the bill and they hadn't charged me for the super glue. And my sinful nature immediately said, ooh, that saved you four ninety nine. <laughs> and then I thought, no, cars will go back. And I didn't want to, I'm really tight on money and uh, I, I didn't want to particularly, but anyway, I went back. Well, the guy, a Muslim chap behind the, the counter, he just couldn't get over it. He kept saying, why have you come back? So I said, do you know, when I was 15 and I went through the story of how somebody explained to me about Jesus dying for me and rising from the dead. And I said, I asked him to become my Lord and Savior. And I said, you know, he so completely changed my life all these years ago. The reason I've, all those years ago, the reason I've come back now is because Jesus brought me to know God when I was 15. Oh, that's really interesting, he said. And I gave him a little book, of course, and, 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 and moved on. There are these opportunities. They're constant. 
Would you pray day by day? Lord Jesus, I'm going to be caught up in study, in work, in pressure. And there's this, that, and this. But this day, today, and tomorrow, and the next day. Lord, this day, would you lead me to somebody with whom I can talk about the Lord Jesus? Going into each new day with a heart that's sort of looking out for opportunities, seeking to transform inconsequential chatter into significant conversation. Oswald Chambers said, how many people have you made homesick for God? It's a nice little phrase. Just to be talking, it's lovely to be kind and to do good things and all the rest, but to actually speak and share the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me end with this little illustration. It comes from Corrie ten Boom. Some of you will know her story. She was in Harlem in Holland at the time of the Second World War and she and her family hid Jews in their home. It's a wonderful little museum to go and see if ever you're there. And um, she, she wrote this. She eventually, somebody turned traitor and the whole family were taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp and all but she died. But she said this. Um, When you stand at the gate of eternity, as I did in the concentration camp, you see things from a different perspective than when you think you may live for a long time. Every time I saw smoke pouring from the chimneys of the crematorium, I asked myself, when will it be my turn to be killed or die? And when you live like that every day in the shadow of the crematorium, there are very few things that are really important, or only one to share with as many people who will listen about the Lord Jesus Christ who is willing that anyone who wants can come to him and find life. So a great visual dramatic passage in Ezekiel 47. Three questions. Am I in the water? And if you're not absolutely certain, I would urge you just to go alone somewhere and say, Lord Jesus, if I've never been in yourself, in this water, which pictures the spiritual experience, Lord, make me yours today. And then, how deep in the water are you? Lord, I don't want to just stand still. I want to grow in spiritual understanding. I want to grow in Christ-likeness. I want to know you increasingly, day by day. And then thirdly, what are you doing to get others into the water. May we all be soul winners in a very secular, cynical age, nevertheless seeking to bring men and women to the Lord Jesus. Amen.